that's the past description. Now, how did the partnership, we have Lindsay here from um, Foodway, but IDDC and Indiana Foodways are both um, organizations here and we saw a potential for the Indiana culinary scene and created a, pro a program, excuse me, based on that. So Indiana Foodways Alliance, I'll just pipe in here, uh, Aisha, for those of you who don't know who we are, we are a non-for-profit non membership marketing organization. And what we have done is we created 21 trails and we've been in existence for um, since the early 2000s, really before the whole foodie movement in the nation um you know, uh, became popular. So um, what we did was we had an organization called the I-69 Cultural Corridor. And um, we had a study with Ball State University to try to figure out, you know, what do all these areas have in common? And then what they came up with was food. And that's how Indiana Foodways was born. And um, DMOs, CVBs, Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development all joined our organization in order to um, promote their restaurants within, within their communities. And um, that was along the Interstate 69. Well, all of Indiana, I'm sorry, um, all of Indiana um, wanted to be a part of it. And that's kind of how the whole uh, statewide organization came to be. Now we do um, uh, partner with individual restaurants as well. But um, the whole uh, organization in itself, the setup is those DMOs buy the membership to our organization. And then we partnered with the state um, in order to use uh, the Banwango passport. Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. So when it comes to the, each other, um, I work with Lindsay a lot in terms of the culinary passport. So Indiana, Visit Indiana is responsible not only for promoting the passport to visitors and to, like in the tourists, but at the same time, we help with marketing efforts, social media campaigns, and of course, like other different campaigns. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the mini campaigns that we do. On the other end, like Lindsay said, they are um, responsible for getting the restaurants involved and vetting them. And then they also have a, um, a very specific process that they go through in order to vet restaurants and then uh, decide to add them on to different trails. And each restaurant, uh, different restaurants may be part of multiple trails. They're not specific. So there could be a restaurant that's not only on the pie trail, but also on the farm to table or a cut above tra uh, trail. So they're not specific. You could, there's a lot of different options uh, that one restaurant can fit in. So if I may, Aisha, I'll just mm -hmm. tag on to that. I think that's the great thing about um, what we do is we vet all of the restaurants that come aboard, as Aisha said. And um, it's a fun process. Um, it's meant to get to know the story behind the restaurant that way that we can tell that um, that story as well as then pass it on to um, IDDC in order for them to be able to tell that too. Um, and we experience the food, we get to meet the owner, uh, learn their story, and then they learn what we do too. So the whole assessment process is very much um, key, uh, uh, an integral part of the partnership. Um, and then also, as Aisha mentioned, each restaurant can be placed on three different trails. So um, it is uh, definitely uh, the vetting process is fun and exciting. And it's a great way to also um, hone in on that partnership with your chamber or with um, the restaurant or your um, um, wh whomever you're working with in, in, in that sense, too. Mm -hmm. All right. So next, next we're going to discuss uh, different marketing strategies. Like I was saying earlier, we do have mini campaign, organic social, we do paid as well. Some of our most popular mini campaigns that we do almost every year, we do like Porktober, which, oops, excuse me. So Porktober, which runs like around October for a month, um, and that's uh, an OD to the Indiana Pork Tenderloin. 
we have the pie trail that we're currently running. It's also one of our most popular. And then here and there we'll do little um, we'll do little activations such as the ice cream uh, ice cream for ice cream uh, activation, which is specifically based on restaurants that serve ice creams and dessert. And through these mini campaigns, we've gathered like a lot of um, not only feedback from like uh, from from uh, people who are going out there and eating at these different restaurants, but they're also, we've been able to create um, different ads based on these mini campaigns. And that has allowed us to like get a lot of uh, people within these businesses. Lindsay, would you like to add anything? Um, sure, sorry, we're in the middle of a, <laughs> a storm here. So um, yes, yeah, so um, one of our biggest campaigns has been um, Porktober and then we're right in the middle of Pie to Pie Day. Right. So we created um, with um, IDDC um, uh, Pie to Pie Day, which is January 23rd National Pie Day and then also um, Pie Day 3.14 Day. So we're in the midst of that campaign right now and it's really popular. Uh, you check into three different um, restaurants and when they on the Hoosier Pie Trail, and when they do that, they get a pair of um, I only have pies for you socks, and you can see those right there in the middle of the um, of the slide. So between that and the Porktober um, marketing campaign, it's really been great, and we've seen um, you know pretty good results and feedback from the restaurants as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will mention is uh, being able to give specific uh, prizes like the I only have pie for you socks. Last year, we had the uh, Pioneer t-shirt uh, for the pie. And then we have different prizes for like different mini campaigns. This gets people excited to go in and check into different restaurants so that they can earn prizes as well. So that's one of the different ways we um, push tourists and other people to just get into these restaurants. So going back to more analytics side, um, of course, I did mention we do, of course, social media campaigns uh, on Instagram, on Facebook. I also utilize Pinterest a lot. And of course, we do blog posts. We have email blasts. And then, of course, we have paid advertising. Um, here's an example of a paid advertising we did on Facebook. There's one for, uh, this is specifically for October. You could see the amount of um, money spent and the, impression, the impressions we got based on how much money was spent and the different traffic. And then this, on this right side right here, this was from last year, uh, the Pi Day to Pi Day trail. And this was, this garnered about 550,000 uh, impressions, like about 2,593 links click and over 8,000 engagement. And we ended up having to ship out 514 t -sh um, shirts. And these are all based on just social media. And then of course the budget that we did set here, which wasn't a big budget, but the organic social also went like a long way. Lindsay also does help a lot with marketing along, like, oh, along with all other businesses in Indiana that are part of the trail. Okay, so the passports officially launched uh, in 2021. We have, ever since we've had more than 400 participating businesses, as of, uh, as of last month, we had over 9,000 visitors sign up for the passport program, and more than 3,000 unique prizes have been collected uh, by visitors. Um, of course, participating restaurants have reported increased traffic and revenue, which is the main reason why we're doing this passport is to get as many people out there and exploring and supporting these local businesses. Um, some of some of the businesses have seen as much as up to like twenty percent increase in sales since joining the program. Okay, I yeah, I will say. Um, <laughs> oh, it's okay. No, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, um, in terms of the restaurants and seeing that feedback, that's been the, the great thing is that with this passport, we've really been able to elevate our organization with our partnership with IDDC and Banwango 
and the visibility for these restaurants as well. So um, it's really been a great partnership. And I know that there are some um, questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if we're going to no. uh, direct those now. I can't see those. That's okay, Lindsay. I will uh, go over those at the end of both presentations. Oh, so we'll do okay, the Q and A sorry. at the end. Um, good. I'm happy you brought that up. So I will be facilitating those at the end of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So in partnership with Ben Wango, of course, uh, we also have other other uh, other passport. We have the state nature passport. With uh, we work with um, with DNR on those. The Pitai uh, Golf Trail, uh, the Indiana Arts and Culture with the Art Council, and then we also have a college life in Indiana passport to encourage uh, college students to get out of campus and actually explore um, around Indiana. All right, so there is our presentation and how we work uh, with. Um, ben Wango, if there are, well, there are questions, so we're going to wait for those at the end. Awesome. Perfect. And I'm going to pass it over to Michelle. Michelle, again, is with Experience Columbus. She will go ahead and introduce herself. But Experience Columbus, I will mention, has done this with multiple passes. So they'll go over, or Michelle will go over both passes that they have. Um, so experts in working with those local associations to build passes. Yes, thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm gonna cover two passes today. My, um, my colleague Hannah is out ill and she was going to cover the um, Columbus Outdoor Trails Pass. So I'm gonna talk about hers and then um, I, I will cover the Columbus Live Music Pass as well. But um, these slides are really very similar. So I don't, uh, I don't anticipate ha having to spend too much time on either one of them. Uh, they're, they're pretty similar. So um, these are both of our free passes. As, as um, Aaron mentioned, we have a lot of passes that uh, we work with Bandwango on um, here in Columbus that are incentivized trails um, and passes, but these two happen to be one of them. The Columbus Outdoor Trails Pass is incentivized, so we'll, we'll, we'll cover that one really quickly here first. The Columbus Outdoor Trails Pass uh, launched in partnership with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, which we refer to as MORPSI. So bear with me when I when I shorten that because it's just easier to say MORPSI. Um, but uh, MORPSI really in 2020 was trying to figure out a way to get people out on, on our Central Ohio Greenways that connect communities in the Central Ohio area. And um, you know, so so we they reached out and we talked about a, a great way to do that might be by creating this digital check-in, di digital pass, um, and with them. So in April of 2020, 2021, excuse me, on National Trails Day, we launched the um, what was then called the Hike, Bike, and Paddle Trail, which we thought was very clever, um, and and it was clever, but we we quickly realized that um, really most of the paths that we are referring to and sending people to were, were paved trails in Columbus. So until we have more offerings that really do, that connect more waterways and water sports and things like that to um, this pass that we, we decided to change the name to the Outdoor Trails Pass because that's exactly what it is. And we wanted it to be crystal clear and um, you know meet people's expectations. So, um, so that's kind of how it came about and, and a quick change that it, that it went through with the name. And, um, that it really is to connect people to to the outdoor trails and, and connect them to the communities. I don't know why this is, I'm not touching anything and it is advancing like crazy right now. Um, let's try this. Okay. So um, what we did is uh, what we do with Morpsey is we manage the trail. Um, they, of course, manage what's going on on the trails, if there's any updates, if there's anything new, if there's anything that's changed, they, they keep us apprised of that. But um, Experience Columbus does the, the pass management with Bandwango. So um, how it is set up at the moment is that anybody that checks in at a trailhead um, and by using the pass, they are automatically entered to win a monthly prize of $100 to a local Columbus business or restaurant. Um, that just happens automatically. And, and that, that person is then at the end of the month chosen by Experience Columbus. And we um, award one person each month with um, a local business uh, prize. Let's see. Um, 
ongoing and how we promote it really is that um, we feature our outdoor trails pass on social media. So again, this April will be, you know, National Trails Day. So we'll, it'll get a lot of promotion then. Um, we incorporate it into our seasonal marketing campaign. Spring break is coming up. It'll be in our spring break campaign, of course. And then um, into our blogs. And we have influencers that, you know, are, are very tuned into different niche markets. And when we bring those influencers in who are outdoor influencers, of course, we introduce them to this trail so that they are also then spreading the word about the Columbus Outdoor Trails Pass um, within their, their followers. Um, we have three visitor centers, two brick and mortar. And so all of our passes are featured in um, on digital screens and in QR codes for people to download our trails um, within our two visitor centers. And then our third is a mobile visitor center where we do go out to um, underserved areas of the community or just large community events. And we promote our passes that way as well. Um, the live music trail, very similar, but this launched last year with uh, the Columbus Music Commission. So the Columbus Music Commission is a very small organization, started out with one person about two years ago, and uh, they're up to, I think, two and a half people right now. And uh, they're really just trying to get the word out about you know all of the live music options that there are in and around Columbus um, and music of every kind and, and typically any night of the week you can find live music. So that's a, a tough story to tell um, just, you know, by everybody having to come into Columbus and, and Google or, um, you know, look at uh, individual venues. So what they, they continued to talk about at the Music Commission was let's let's put together a, a map. Let's put together a music map. And um, that's kind of what this is at the moment. It, for lack of a better word, because it is not an incentivized trail just yet. We do plan to introduce incentives, uh, check-in incentives this year, uh, probably around third quarter. But right now, um, this is really just a listing of live music venues in the Columbus area. It is broken down by um, community. It is, um, and people can find, uh, they can also look at what type of music. So um, it's a really great way to to really promote all of the different types of music that we have in Columbus and to really get the message and the mission of the Columbus Music Commission out there that, that music is everywhere and, and we can connect you to it. And, the, and an easy way to do it is by downloading this, this app or this download um, Bandwango app and, and working with us to, to keep that information updated. So um, the Columbus Music Commission is housed in our building at the moment, so really easy to uh, to make changes. But you know, it is it is a lot more to keep up with simply because music venues come and go, and so you know this is this is one that require requires constant attention. So we rely on the Columbus Music Commission to make sure that they are on top of those venues, anything new coming into the market, um, or anything that that is perhaps not around any longer, and making sure that that pass is updated all the time. Uh, the users can check in once they are in a proximity of the front door of each of these places so that we know that they're actually there. And again, right now, this is this really is just a check. I've been here and they can kind of follow along all the places that they have been to in Columbus or, or wish to go to in Columbus. And sooner um, or later this year, it will be it will be incentivized for them to do that as well. Um, very similarly, we work with our influencers. We do have music influencers that come into Columbus and um, and write about this. We include it on our blogs. It is, of course, a lot of social media goes uh, around this. Um, the Columbus Music Commission, of course, has all of their followers and their channels that this gets cross-promoted on. So um, it does get nice promotion. I will say that this not being an incentivized trail, we are feeling the difference here in Columbus because all of our other trails that are incentivized are very heavily used and redemptions are extremely high. And this one, um, we have, we've only in about a year, we've only had, it, it launched last June and in about a year, we've only had 342 downloads. Um, so that's pretty low for, for us in Columbus to, to, um, to digest. So, you know, we know, we know that, that people really are, um, into getting some kind of a, a reward. And it really does drive traffic into those local businesses if they feel like they're not only supporting the local business, which is really our goal, and, but it's also that, that they are gonna, gonna get something fun and, and gamified from it. So um, that one is, is 
I know it's going to to really take off once we incentivize it. But I mean, it's still doing great. It's just that we'll, we'll put a lot more oomph behind our our marketing efforts once it is incentivized, and we know that there's you know something new to promote around it. I, of course, just covered our marketing strategies, very similar to what we do with the Outdoor Trails Pass and all of our passes is we heavily promote them at our visitor centers. We have um, business cards printed up for each one with the, the, uh, the logo on there and a QR code to get directly to download that pass. And, um, and we, get, we get so many interested people in all of our different trails. So this is an extremely successful uh, venture for us in all, with all of our Bandwango passes. Awesome. And that's it for me. Love it. Awesome. Well, we will jump into Q&A. We have questions that have come in. Um, if there are any other questions that you have, feel free to keep them rolling. I also have some questions on deck. So again, keep those coming in. So we will do the first question. And Lindsay, I know that people are kind of seeing there's a little bit of chaos on Lindsay's person. She's actually in the middle of a storm right now. She's got tornado watches. So Lindsay may be hopping on and off. She's got a lot going on near her. So um, first question, I believe Lindsay would be the best person to direct this to, but what standards do you use to assess the restaurants that make them exceptional? So we have a, a, a an entire uh, assessment form. And what we do is, um, it's our stamp of approval. So um, those questions can be, um, you know, obviously, you know, Board of Health, safety standards. Um, and we really rely heavily on our partners, too, in order to, you know, they're not really going to steer us in the wrong direction in terms of um, a restaurant. But, you know, as far as individual, we go in, we assess cleanliness, um, you know, lighting, food quality, um, experience on our own um, and then we have a whole form that we fill out but it's really just our stamp of approval i wouldn't say it makes them exceptional um i i definitely wouldn't like you know use that term we think they're all exceptional but it's let's use the term uh stamp of approval from indiana foodways alliance perfect awesome and then Question about prizes for Porktober is when this came in and Pi Day, so, um, and the Pi Campaign. So what is the call to action for getting the prize? So I believe she means on ads. So for right now, Pi Day to Pi Day, all you need to do is check in through three different uh, restaurants that are on the Pi Trail. And once you do that, uh, we do ship out um, the prizes to whoever, because of course, like the back end of Bandwango allows us to go in and get the analytics of who checked in and when and how many to determine whether or not they um, they won those prizes. However, in general, because um, Bandwango now has a point system, um, so now, for instance, like we have like the culinary hat, and in order to get the culinary hat, you need 500 points, and 500 points basically is equals to five different five check-in at different restaurants. So, um, so that's how we're going on. We're going about um, finding, uh, figuring out the whole uh, prize points at this point. But for the individual campaigns, like. Um, we do it differently depending on um, the popularity of the trail. So like for Porktober, we did a different amount of check-ins versus um, the Pie Trail. Right. The Pie Trail um, was um, uh, uh, more popular um, in past history. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll do a couple uh, more check-ins than what we have done on the uh, Porktober and the uh, Tenderloin Lovers Trail. So it really depends on the popularity of the trail too. Correct. So one question came in, are all 21 food trails on one Banwango Pass? I can answer that, but Aisha, I'll let you answer that as well. Just um, Yes, they are all on one Banwango Pass. Yes. So. Um, what they have done is they've created different sections in their Van Wango Pass. So those different trails are the different labels in the pass um, with the different restaurants. And as mentioned before, there are restaurants that live in two different sections or two different trails. So that is possible as well. I do want to talk about, before we get into another question, the logistics of the specific prizes to the trails, because I know we'll get some questions <laughs> to client success managers after that. And I want to touch on Visit Indiana does this themselves in the back end. So
in those reports that you have, you can see who's checking into what restaurants. Visit Indiana does a lot of manual labor. Uh, unfortunately, Van Wango can't say these people have checked into these specific trails. So Visit Indiana is in the back end saying these people are the specific winners of the pie socks or the Porktober t-shirt. So just questions that come in about that, that is how they do that. Did you want me to um, speak to that, Erin? You can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, so for instance, now that we're doing the pie trail, I'll go in the back end and I'll pull a report. And instead of just regularly uh, doing a check-in report, I'll do a check-in report, but I'll make sure I enter specifically only the pie restaurants. So even though we have all these restaurants on our culinary trail passport, I have to make sure that only pie uh, restaurants that are on the pie trail are added there. And then I also have to put in specific dates. Now, based on those specific dates, I am able to export it. And then once I export it, I kind of go through making sure that, um, you know, cross-examining and making sure like the one email has checked in three times. So I count that as a winner. And then I, um, I then go and go ahead and email them and just to let them know that they have won a prize and that their prize should be on their way. So Erin is right. It is a lot of manual labor um, on the back end when it comes to some of the mini campaigns. Yeah. But we do get a lot of questions from uh, current partners or prospects of how do we make sure that our campaigns are successful for the year that they're active or the years to come. These are really great examples. I use Porktober all the time when I was talking to clients. So, take a specific month, really highlight that month, get people into maybe some of the restaurants or some of the trails on your pass. Um, and these can really push that engagement during that month, even though it may take a little bit of extra um, manual labor on the organization's part. So George came in with a question, how was the list of participating restaurants gathered and what was required for implementation at the restaurant level? So Lindsay kind of touched on that stamp of approval, but can you guys talk about the implementation at the restaurant level? Lindsay, did you bring in all the contact information, those photos, all of that to Aisha and to Van Wingo? Absolutely. Um, so my process is, um, well, we'll just go back to the DMO level. If the DMO is the one who's purchased the, the membership to our restaurant, um, we have different levels. So for instance, we have a charter level, we have a and then um, whatever they buy, then that's how many restaurants um, are on uh, with that area. Now, the restaurant communication in itself, you know, um, it's a challenge. Um, how we do do that is we make sure that we gather all that information through that assessment process. That's why it is so important for us to do those assessments. And then we will send out information via our newsletter that hits the restaurants in those DMA or, or DMO, pardon me, um, and then the economic development uh, folks or anyone who is a member of Foodways will, you know, communicate what's happening on a monthly or bi-monthly basis or, you know, per campaign or, or whatever. So, and then we also rely on them, those members to uh, talk to the restaurants too. So, it, it doesn't go, go without um, air. I mean, as we all know, working with restaurants, I mean, it can be challenging. They're, um, that's kind of the cons of the whole thing. Uh, you know, while we're here to help, it's also they're struggling too. And, you know, whether it be staff or um, our goal as Foodways, um, you know, we only promote locally owned restaurants. So we do not um, allow franchises to be a part of our organization. That's our whole mission. And so, you know, these are folks who are, this is their way of life. This is what they're doing. And, you know, they're busy, they're busy people. So I will say the communication, you know, it, it doesn't go without struggle, but we manage and we make it work. And then we communicate with IDDC on changes within the restaurant, um, photos, um, any kind of communication that, that they would need on there and for Van Wango. Yeah. And I think we can all touch on how difficult it can be to get in touch with merchants and get them on board to, on one of these passes, which was the whole point of this webinar is working with those local associations, do that live music trail, but work with the music commission, do the farm to table pass, work with food waste alliance or um, downtown associations, work with those main street associations or those 
true local organizations that have that contact or can be one-to-one -one with those uh, businesses to get them on their passes. And Van Wango encourages that. We're definitely not going to put a stiff arm and say, well, they're not a client of ours. We encourage our clients to work with whatever resources they have possible to get in touch with those uh, businesses to get them on these passes. So next question, this is towards you, Michelle. So has it, anyone had an issue with service in regards to checking in, specifically thinking about the outdoor trails pass? You know, when we first launched, we did. Um, it, 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 but it was a geofencing kind of an issue. But uh, quite honestly, we reached out to Bandwango and it was fixed very quickly. <laughs> so um, we have not had ongoing issues with um, with any problems with people checking in, because that is kind of also how the music pass uh, check-ins go as well. They need to be within a certain perimeter of, of the front door. So um, no, the answer is no. It, it has been pretty seamless uh, for both of these passes awesome. that rely on that technology. Yeah, and Can I just I, chime to, in on what you what you just were saying oh gosh, about working please, with yeah. community partners yeah. is that you know from a DMO standpoint, it's it's a great connector for us to connect with these community partners and then for them to go out to their businesses and, and create these relationships. You know, we feel like it's a win win win. So um, while they may not be a direct client of Bandwango, of course we are, and um, it, it boosts our they boost the perception of what we can bring to the table to these other community partners that, and then they are then boosting their own perception with their local merchants. So I really think it's just a, a, a crazy good win for everybody at the table. Awesome. No, thank you so much for adding that. And back to the technology side and can people check in where and when. Um, the only time that Van Wango really hears about these errors is if there's a lapse in service, if you don't have cell service and you're depending on that GPS uh, component. So our customer service team is always working. Um, if you have anyone that has troubles with checking in and out, at an outdoor location, we're always here to help with that. There's also different types of redemption that you can do. So you can do the so you have to be in a certain uh, perimeter around that location. You can do pin check-in as well. So maybe you wanted to have a poster or a piece of collateral there with that pin number. Uh, that is also available. And then just the easy redemption that you should click to check in. So a few different yeah, options there. Say, Go ahead, Lizzie. If I could just pipe in for a second. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, we have had some struggles with it, um, you know, for all transparency, but it's, you know, it is all about the the service. So we have areas in Indiana where, and I'm sure everywhere else, you know, everyone else does too, but um, where, you know, we literally, there are, there's no cell service or, yeah. you know, <laughs> and so we really rely heavily on those pens. Um, yeah. And um, so I think that's the biggest part is that communication with, um, you know, making sure the restaurants have the pens. And that does come with challenges too, of making sure all the staff knows, um, you know, what that means. And so we really rely heavily on our partners, um, our DMO partners and economic development and chambers. So that's why that relationship, going back to what Michelle said, it is so important for us to maintain that relationship too, going back to that section, but um, the pins and, and the pins do work. So it's kind of just a workaround. Yeah. Well uh, I'll mention, uh, Aaron, another thing, well, specifically uh, me uh, here in the office, I, I also kind of take on the role of customer service whenever we have issues like this. And a lot of times what I, it takes me less than a few minutes to just uh, go in the back end of Ben Wango, find a person who's emailing about not being able to check in and I can actually go ahead and check them in. So I'll, I'll get a lot of messages with pictures. Hey, I was here. I'm not sure what happened. I wasn't able to check in and I'm able to redeem their check-in so that they're not missing out. And a lot of time people are very appreciative of that because they feel like, okay, well now I want to go ahead and check into the next location because I'm only a few points away from my next prize. Absolutely. And for those who aren't as familiar with our back end, or <laughs> Aisha has a lot of expertise in that area, our client success team is always here to help too. So we have a bunch of people, this is their jobs, the, here to help and make sure that the technology is work, working properly. But um, Jalen had asked, is the culinary pass only available to local establishments, no chains or franchises? Lindsay, you just touched on this, but if you wanted to say. I, I do. So our mission is to promote locally owned restaurants all throughout the state. We do not allow, I know I said this, but we do not allow chains. The only exception that we do make um, are 
like local franchises. So let's say, you know, we had somebody that originated in Lafayette, West Lafayette, or, um, you know, Fort Wayne, it was the original, um, you know, restaurant, then, then we do make that exception. And then we had a question come in about the profitability of the passes. So do these passes generate income for your nonprofits or are they grant funded initiatives to drive local business? If they do generate income, where does it come from? I'm going to touch on this one first. Um, these are all free passes, so they can touch on how it works with grants and if it produces profitability for them. But if you're interested in really producing profitability for your nonprofits, we do have paid passes as well. So coming up with a paid pass initiative is a great way to go about this. So if you're interested um, and you are a client, make sure to talk to your client success specialist about those paid pass options or our sales team is always happy to talk about it. But if you guys want to touch on that as well for you all. So I guess I'll pipe in. Um, in terms of, um, we're not for profit, so we're not, we're not really in this to, to make a ton of money here. Um, we do work with IDDC in terms of, um, sponsorship opportunities within these special marketing campaigns. Um, so for instance, Porktober, we worked with Indiana Soybean Alliance, which is our, uh, state soybean, soybeans feed pork, um, or I'm sorry, um, pigs, hogs, and so, um, and then also the Indiana Pork Producers Association. So we really try to tie in um, that sponsorship opportunity um, on these special marketing campaigns. Um, and then for uh, Pie to Pie Day, we work with um, a locally owned pie company that's nationally known and sells national and international, which is called Wix Pie Company. So we do branch out in terms of that sponsorship opportunity to make money. Um, but our organization, we aren't necessarily in it to, to make a ton of money, but we do offer those sponsorship opportunities. And I would say um, that we, we kind of do the same thing. Um, we, we are a nonprofit, a not-for-profit, so we don't do this to, to make money there have been a couple of instances with other passes that are free um, that we, of course, just budget for. And, and that includes the incentives that we, um, you know, give give to the past participants. But there have been a couple of instances where there's a local partner that it just makes great sense for them to, to really cross promote this for us. So they have paid a very minimal, you know, sponsorship fee, for lack of a better word, um, really just to get their name included, um, you know, on a few more of our blog posts. But for the most part, these are these are free passes and we budget for it in our destination experience budget each year. And for those sponsorship opportunities as well, there is a way to add um, an add on to your pass. So talk to your client success specialist if you're ever interested in having an add on the pass uh, when people are scrolling through those businesses as well. So. Are there any good rules of thumb or best practices for working with other associate, associations to manage passes? One thing I'm going to add from the Van Wango perspective, it always helps to have a point person with the client um, of Van Wango on these passes. So even if your partner is really taking the reins on these passes or that local association is going to do everything for the pass, we always appreciate having one uh, point person from our partner that can kind of guide us through and make sure that everything is going smoothly just because we have a relationship with you all. We know you, we wanna know the goals of both organizations, but um, having that point person is really important from our perspective. But passing it on to you guys to go over from your, your perspective. I mean, um, go ahead, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I think that the communication is definitely the key and having that one point person, um, me being the point person with foodways in the restaurants and our partners, and then Aisha and I working together, and then Aisha being that point person with Van Wango makes for a really smooth transition with information. Yeah. Uh, same. I mean, it's communication. It's, you know, making sure that you have the same goals in mind. Um, 
you know, honestly, we're doing a lot of the, the back end work for these associations. So there's never really a lot of pushback. There's more just um, ideation and, you know, trying to come up with new ways to promote it and, um, you know, keep people engaged differently. So that's it's it's really pretty smooth. Um, it has been for us so far working with outside organizations because we're, we're all in it for the same reasons. Right. Awesome. This question is for uh, the Culinary Trails Pass. So does each restaurant have a different checking code for each trail or how do you manage having restaurants in multiple passes? Uh, so, so they're actually all within still the Culinary Trail and they each does each, rest, each restaurant does have a, a, a specific code, QR code. Um, you can check in by just being within a specific location, a uh, close distance. But if not, you can also walk into like the front desk and they will have a code if you're not able to check in based on your location. Awesome. How do you grab the interest of a visitor rather than a resident who can collect the points? A visitor is only there for a bit of time. I would say uh, from the Van Wango perspective, there's different places that you can market that will hit those visitors versus residents. We never want our partners to ever forget about those residents because they are the ones that are going to actively be checking in um, throughout the year that this is active or if it's a short term pass. Getting your locals uh, into what the organization is doing is always important, but marketing in those hotels, uh, making sure that not only are you getting heads in beds, but those people have things to do is something uh, really important. How you're putting those digital ads out, so those display ads, um, those Facebook ads can target uh, visitors rather than locals. But do you guys have any other uh, recommendations? I, I would definitely agree with what you said. Uh, those targeted ads are really helpful. I've actually, specifically based on the passports that I oversee, I've seen a lot of, we actually have a, family in Chicago who came in and they've literally done every they they check they went to every single uh location in the um the DNR the uh, the the state nature passport they completed every single location on there and won every single prize and they lived in Chicago so um those targeted ads are absolutely helpful I would same. I mean, I, I think it's just it's good, smart marketing. But um, I will say that for our incentivized trails, um, we are very specific about making sure that somebody wins a prize after four stops. And it doesn't matter how big the trail is. Every single trail has a prize associated with it after four check ins. So if it's um, the coffee trail, for instance, which is another one of our free passes, they can go to four out of 19 shops and they're, they're going to win something and walk away with something that's nice quality and, and fun for them. Um, with the outdoor trails pass, of course, that's you, you check in anywhere and you're automatically entered to win that prize. So there's incentive for visitors to do that um, just just, you know, for the chance to win and to experience some of the, the beautiful trailways that we have in the Columbus area. So, you know, I think there's a different way, there are different ways, there are itineraries that we put around some of those check-ins that tell them what they can do in two to three hours or two to three days. So we give them different opportunities to experience the city if they're here for a few hours or they're here for a long weekend. So um, I'll chime in too. I've noticed that um, a lot of our partners, the DMO partners, they, they have um, a great example is um, Visit Hendricks County, which is um, on the west side of Indianapolis. Um, I don't know if their representatives are, are listening today, but they did a really great job on um, Pi. They wrote a whole blog in terms of um, where to visit the best places for an hour or, or two um, within Hendricks County for uh, the Hoosier Pie Trail and being a part of that. So our goal is to work with our, our DMO partners, and then they've really uh, branched out and used our campaigns as part of their campaign. So it's a great partnership amongst all of us. And we're all sending the same message, whether it's for their area or for the whole state. Awesome. Perfect. Do you ask that participating businesses or venues become a partner of the DMO? I'm going to touch base on this too. We work with all types of different organizations here at Van Wango. So a lot of the chambers we work with, it does need to be a membership it's membership based, so they do need to be members. That also helps them get more members of, hey, you wanna be a part of this cool pass we're doing? Become a member of our organization and we can do that. But for you all, the restaurants need to be a part of 
the uh, Indiana Foodways Alliance or the well, DMO needs to be a member of the Indiana Foodways Alliance and then you find the restaurants, right? Either way. Okay. It depends also if the DMO that has purchased the partnership is a membership-based DMO, then they the, that restaurant would need to be a part. So it just depends on what kind of um, organization they are too and how okay. they work their memberships, if they are even membership-based. Um, and in Columbus, uh, with these community uh, passes, no, the answer is no. Um, we do not require that they become a member of the DMO. On the passes that we solely manage, yes, they do have to be a member of Experience Columbus. Aisha, did you want to add anything? Oh, no, not on this. Okay, case. perfect. Um, and we have been getting asked a lot of questions about if we don't have a list uh, strongs we want to participate in this pass, what are our options? So as we've talked about this entire webinar, creating that partnership uh, with someone that does have that list, or it might not be an organization, it might be an influencer in town, it might be just a group of people that you find that are really well connected in the community that you are interested in working with for these passes. So even though you might not have this list of 200 amazing restaurants that you want to be on a pass, there are people in your community that might have that list that you can partner with and get in uh, with creating these passes. So Daniel has a few questions about prizes here. So what kind of prizes are they winning? Um, do you guys want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I can touch up uh, a little bit on that. There are different prizes for different pass uh, passports. For instance, the culinary trail, we have um, we have a pie server, we have a culinary hat, we also have a wine tumbler at this time, and then we 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 have water bottles, sunglasses. We even have a custom um, art prize by like a local artist for like the arts um, for the arts and culture trail. So it just depends on what the trail is. We try to make sure that every single prize is geared towards a specific passport. Um, and then in terms of how many uh, prizes we send out, honestly, it, this all depends on the person who's checking in. Um, we did a prize shipment last week because we do everything in-house here. Um, and the, pri the prizes that we shipped out, there was a few people where they literally had earned almost every single um, prize that we have for every single trail. So they'll be receiving like a box of like a bunch of goodies. So. A swag bag. <laughs> uh, same here. It depends on the trail. Um, we do try to keep it, uh, the prizes geared towards the trail. So our Columbus style pizza trail, they of course earn a, a stainless steel pizza cutter. Um, and with all of our trails, the very first prize at that four stop is a, a really high quality t-shirt with a fun uh, slogan on it. Um, and, and we want that because then people are going to wear that t-shirt. If it's good quality and you know soft and it's going to last and it has a fun logo on it, then they're going to wear it around and people are, it's going to create attention. So that's one of our marketing ploys too, is, is that, um, you know, they're, they're winning a really nice t-shirt and, um, and we're getting marketing billboards walking around with our t-shirt on. So um, they all get that, but then then we gear the, the other prizes towards whatever the trail is, like the stainless steel pizza cutter, um, a custom drink mixer for our distillery trail, um, a very high quality um, tumbler for a coffee tumbler for our coffee trail. The, as I said, the uh, music trail will be incentivized and um, at the end of the year or towards the end of the year, and then the check-in on the outdoor pass is uh, is a hundred dollar drawing um to a local business so you know they're getting a hundred dollars a local business is getting you know supported and exposure so that's that's a, a a great one as well yeah awesome and with the question of how many winners do you send the prizes to so that is through Wango technology you can set it up to, for them to win a prize with a certain amount of points so whenever they check in they get allotted that amount of points and then you'll have a kind of marketplace with your prizes of what they they can choose what they win with their points that they've uh, created so when you have your first pass build you decide what amount of points you want to set each prize to um, and then go from there so we can also help with prizes as well in during those pass builds but okay um we're closing up here so make sure to get your questions in but my question is is what have the challenges been with working with 
an association or Lindsay, what are the challenges of working uh, and creating these band wingo passes or this band wingo pass, would you say? Um, I honestly, the communication with the restaurants and making sure, you know, to be transparent that I feel like Aisha would probably say the same thing in terms of, you know, working with us. It's making sure everybody is privy to the information. Yes. Um, as we know, restaurants, you know, they turn over staff, um, staffing's different every day. I think that communication with them is key and we really rely heavily on our DMO partners for that. If that's the membership model that, um, in that area that we're working with. Um, and then just, I, that's our, that's our biggest thing is the communication with the restaurants, um, and our communications with the DMO. Okay. I mean, really, ours is probably the same. Of course, outdoor trails. You know, there's <laughs> we don't have to worry about you know merchants <laughs> work not telling us. <laughs> so. But um, but on the on the music trail, absolutely. It, you know, and we as I said earlier, we did leave that communication piece up to the music commission. So perhaps you know their communication style maybe was a little different than the way we would have approached it or, um, you know, it was new to them too. So I think it was in retrospect, we probably could have made um, the music commission crystal clear, you know, about what all the benefits are and, and being able to communicate those benefits to these very small micro businesses. And some, I mean, if you think about live music venues in your own areas, there's probably, you know, some dive bars that are real <laughs> small and, you know, they don't have a lot of, um, you know, cash flow, but, um, it, you know, the, a communication does need to take place and an explanation of how beneficial it can be to drive traffic to them. So it would be, you know, making sure that your partners are just um, very fluent in what the benefits are of, of the partnership. Awesome. And I, I want to say, you know, the partnership's always fluid too. It's like the yeah. communication, we learn, we learn, I learn something every week about, oh, well, we should have done that or right. we need to do better at this. It's a learning process, a learning curve all the way around. We have over a 300 restaurants throughout the state that we deal with. And so I don't know about you, Aisha, I'm sure you, you feel the same way, but we literally learn something new every week. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. There's always, it's, it's ongoing. The changes are a lot, so it keeps you on your toes, but it's, it's fun and exciting work. So. Yeah. Awesome. We did get a question. Um, if it's an ongoing pass, do you reset it annually and can people receive a prize multiple times? So, uh, yes, so some of our passes, we've actually kept them on for like two years so that they can run as long as possible. And um, once we do reset it, like the people can go back in and re-earn prizes. One thing we, we, we do to make sure that like people are aware and they're not losing out on some of their check-ins already, if there's a pass that's like will expire in a few months we'll start sending messaging not only through our um our own emails but through the back end of ben wango to pass holders so that they let them know you have until this day to check in and finish redeeming your prizes because after this day you will have to re-sign up so just communicating with pass holders as well so that they're not confused or they're not losing points because it definitely sucks to check into 50 locations and then you're, you know, you're one, you're one location away from winning a prize. And next thing you know, your pass um, expires without you knowing. So just keeping them informed. Same, same in Columbus. Perfect. I mean, it's exactly the same. I have nothing more to add. Awesome. Perfect. Yes. And you choose the expiration date of the pass when the pass is built. And um, you can always set a limit on prizes as well. I forgot to mention this with Daniels. If you only have a certain prize allotment, let's say you only order 200 t-shirts, you can set that in the Van Wango back end when we build the pass. And so it will not go above that. So for non-incentivized passes, can you opt in a business like a music venue without them knowing, or is it suggested that they opt in themselves? So it depends on how you're building the pass. If the pass is a GPS check it, GPS check-in or a pin check-in, the business needs to be aware. Um, they need to be in the know because they're gonna get questions about how do I check in for this? How does this work? All of that information. For the outdoor trail sort of type of thing, if you just wanted to like have a saving or have just like a, 
let's say just like a trail. So like how the music uh, trail is set up right now, they don't have a incentive for that. So you could just technically go in and check in at that and it could be more of like a tour guide pass. Um, again, we don't see the best results from these types of passes just because people want to be incentivized by either a discount or they want to be incentivized by a prize. And so with those prizes, you don't want people just going through and checking in and everything uh, because there is no pin or GPS validation there. So depending on how you set up your pass, technically, you could, but we don't recommend it because we want your pass to be as successful as possible. So when you reset, they have to re-sign up for the pass or will their account still exist and just be back at zero? This is a great question. We do have people re-sign up for passes and there are a few reasons for this and we do get pushback about this a lot. So I'm glad this is being brought up. We want people to re-engage with these passes. We want them to see the businesses again. If there's new deals or discounts, we want them to be engaged with that. So we do have people re-sign up for passes when a pass expires. This is also due to GDPR laws and rules. Um, we need them to re-engage and opt back into communication. So a um, few different reasons that we have this, and we do have a blog coming out this week about um, re-engagement and re-signing up for passes and why that, those pass refreshes are so important. So stay tuned for that. But did you all have any other closing remarks we wanted to touch on or any other questions? Awesome. No, I don't. But thank you. Thanks for having us today. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you all for joining. And I want to let you all know that are attending, you'll receive this in a recording afterwards. Also on the landing page, all of our emails are available. You can reach out to us if you have any questions. But thanks for all, all for joining. Join us for our March webinar. It will be included in our current client newsletter and prospect newsletter that goes out here shortly. So have a great week, everyone, and happy March.